for joining this morning um, or afternoon. If you're coming to us international, I don't know. I can't tell where everyone's coming from. So uh, hope everyone, all of the U.S. Uh, participants had a enjoyable and relaxing Thanksgiving holiday. So I'm going to do my best today to be fake Jerry Hunt for the day. So I know I'm not quite, you know, I'm not quite what, what you're looking forward to seeing, but I'm going to do my best to, uh, to make him proud here. So today we have a, a good educational webinar session for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is going to be an SDA 101. If you're familiar with the DSUA conferences of the past, a lot of times we would have a SDA 101 or a dry FGD 101 session for people to come in to learn the basics of, of the various uh, products out there, AQCS product lines. So this is, this is going to be kind of along those lines. It's going to cover a lot of topics. Um, it's going to basically talk about, you know, purpose, principles, lessons learned, observations. I think you're going to gain a lot from this. I also want to go ahead and thank our sponsors. So just running through the list here, we've got uh, LAWAS North America, Mississippi Lime, Leckler, uh, Reaction Analytics Solutions Corporation, Atlas Carbon, ReadyCam, PrimeX, Integrated Global Services, Gecko Robotics, National Filter Media, and RPM Solutions. So once again, this webinar would not be in the whole series would not be possible without our sponsors. Um, if you haven't yet, go check out the DSUA website. There is a plethora of information out there, whether it be past recordings of webinars or past presentations, which two of our presenters today have contributed to that over the years substantially. So feel free to check that out. If you have any questions about the DSUA website, you can click the link down at the bottom to send an email to ask for, ask for support or if you can't access something, just click the link and it'll send an email to, to us and we'll help you out there. So today, uh, oh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Travis Reynolds. Uh, so I'm your vice president. I once again, fake, fake Jerry Hunt for the day. So um, today moderating this webinar is going to be Lauren Roos. Um, she is commercial manager for RWI Manufacturing. Lauren, I think you're also acting as an advisor and you've been doing that for several months, haven't you? I am, yep. All right, perfect. Um, you're a contract manufacturer, RWI Manufacturing is a contract manufacturer and field services company that specializes in providing solutions to air, air pollution control OEMs. Uh, you spent your time and your career working in air pollution uh, control, uh, including equipment design, sales, aftermarket, uh, sorbent optimization, and as an end user at a glass plant. So, Lauren, welcome. And I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Travis. I think if you're the fake Jerry Hunt, does that make me the fake Mitch Lund today? <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't have the beard. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm no. sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. So before I introduce the speakers, um, I just wanted to make a note to the audience that your participation um, in the webinar is highly encouraged. Uh, submit your questions. I believe there's a Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen that you can click. Um, and both Travis and I will be monitoring that throughout the webinar um, and asking questions at uh, three different points through the webinar. So uh, please submit your questions. It's highly encouraged. Um, so today I'm going to introduce both Stuart and John, our presenters. We have uh, two industry experts from Primex Process, um, and they're going to teach you all about SDAs. So first up, I'm going to introduce Stuart Nicholson. Stuart is the president and founder of Primex Process Specialists a professional services firm specializing in power generation asset optimization. Um, he's informed by 30 years of experience in the power industry, and his mission is to help dry scrubber users improve process safety, reliability, and efficiency. Stewart's also a U.S. patent holder, ASME published author, professional engineer, co-founder, and former president of the Dry Scrubber Users Association. Uh, Good morning, so, everybody. Yeah. Good morning, Stuart. Presenting alongside him is John Kirsch. John has almost 40 years of experience in the power generation industry in construction, engineering, and maintenance with the last 20 plus years at two dry scrubbed coal-fired power plants in New Jersey. John has been an attendee and a presenter at the Dry Scrubber Users Conference since 2007. He's a professional engineer and a member of the of ASME. Got it. And I'll, uh, I think it's over to you now, Stuart. Okay. 
Thanks, Lauren. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, good morning to uh, our audience. Thank you all for participating. Um, really happy to have the opportunity to speak to uh, what may be a global audience this morning. This is a, a wonderful, uh, you know, moment to uh, express a little bit of what's what we've learned and also, um, you know, share some some uh, valuable knowledge, uh, which is the purpose of the Dry Scrubber Users Association. And I do want to say thanks for the DSUA to uh, for giving uh, me and John this opportunity to uh, talk about SDA. 101 and technology fundamentals. Um, so I'm just going to uh, jump right in here and kind of summarize what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, this is a really sort of an introduction, I guess, to dry scrubbers and specifically the spray dryer absorber um, type of dry scrubber. Um, these are used uh, very uh, commonly in the United States and, and around the world for acid gas uh, control in mostly in combustion processes. Um, so really, we're going to just sort of talk about the uh, basic overview of the spray dryer absorbers, uh, the different styles of SDAs that exist, um, what the purpose of a SDA is, and um, again, some of the, the principles, basic principles and common configurations. Um, that's going to be a kind of a short segment, uh, but we'll, we'll jump through that and then uh, we'll pause there for the first uh, opportunity for, for questions and answers. And just to uh, reiterate what Lauren said, um, you know, we, we're here to answer your questions. Uh, so I, we do have some sort of lecture material here, but really we, we want to hear from you. So uh, if you're a newcomer to the industry or even if you're experienced, uh, by all means, please submit your Q&A and uh, Lauren and Travis will uh, gather those up and we'll address questions uh, as we go through this uh, at uh, appropriate intervals. Uh, so anyway, after uh, the overview, then we're going to drop down into, um, you know, the factors that affect performance. And this is really going to be about the things that we can control. So what we want to do is understand what we can control and also understand what we cannot control. And then really drill down into each of the things that are controllable and how they connect. Um, how they work, how they affect each other, and how they affect the things that dry scrubber users are most concerned with um, in the ownership, operation, and maintenance of these systems. So as we go through each one of those factors, we're also going to kind of say, well, what are the lessons learned in, in each of these sort of segments? Um, and try and kind of distill it down to, you know, what are the common problems? Um, and what are some of the best practices that have been developed uh, over the years that SDAs have been operating? Um, and John, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to jump in here. Do you want to mention your participation? Sure. Um, hopefully I'm going to give uh, the, uh, the counterpoint, if you will, uh, offer uh, uh, some anecdotes that we've run into both from the operation, maintenance, and engineering uh, side. Um, of running one of these uh, scrubbers in a in a coal-fired power plant. Excellent. All righty. Okay, so <clears throat> let's get started in the uh, SDA overview and talk about the basic purpose, principles, and common configurations. Um, so this is just kind of a uh, an illustration of a dry scrubber. Um, on, a, on the back end of a, in this example, a coal-fired power plant. Um, so the components here are basically the SDA, which is the spray dryer absorber vessels, uh, fabric filter or bag house. Let's see if I can get some pointing going on here. <clears throat> so the SDA is shown in a two sort of absorber parallel configuration, taking flue gas off the, uh, in this case, through the boiler, through a selective catalytic system, for NOx removal, um, and then the two SDAs with a common bag house ID fan and stack. So this is a fairly common configuration. Uh, as I said, this would be you know typical for coal-fired power generation. A lot of the uh, waste to energy applications of SDAs are also arranged similar to this. So this is sort of the most common um, configuration of an SDA in a dry scrubber application. Um, this is just a little bit of a focus here. <clears throat> on one particular kind of SDA vessel. 
Uh, this is the uh, originally the Niro Technologies, now licensed and sold by Babcock and Wilcox, uh, at least in the United States, showing the absorber vessel, uh, in this case a rotary atomizer, and the flue gas disperser ducts from the roof and the central gas dispersers here, and the uh, flue gas outlet duct, which you see illustrated over here, taking flue gas uh, out to the bag house. So that's just kind of a typical uh, SDA configuration, uh, very common. All right, so, so let's sort of look at that in a more schematic way. <clears throat> uh, this shows the, again, the two parallel SDA vessels uh, with a common fabric filter, ID fan. Um, so a very simplified schematic of an SDA with rotary atomizers. Again, this is a very typical configuration so we think of it in two pieces. Uh, on the left hand is sort of the reagent preparation end of the process where we're making up the slurries and, and the other fluids that are necessary to spray into the SDA vessels. And then on the right hand side, the uh, flue gas desulfurization component. Um, I think it, you know, we should say that the basic purpose of the, of the SDA is to, is to remove acid gas components. Uh, that are typically contained in contained, excuse me, contained in in combustion flue gas. So for the most part, that's uh, sulfur dioxide, SO2, um, sulfur trioxide, hydrogen chloride. Um, at, at, spray dryers are also very effective at removing certain species of mercury um, and other acid gas components. So it's sort of a a, a broad, broadly applicable. Uh, system for uh, air pollution control in combustion processes. Uh, you know, the basic principle is simple. We're, we're basically uh, making a chemi chemical reaction occur in the, most of it, which occurs in the SDA vessel. Um, so, you know, one of the chemical reactions that would take place is the, the lime, the calcium hydroxide that is produced in the reagent preparation systems, uh, reacts with sulfur, sulfur dioxide to produce a solid byproduct, um, you know, a calcium sulfate, calcium sulfite, and similar compounds. These solid byproducts are then captured in a bag house or fabric filter, sometimes in the older systems, maybe an electrostatic precipitator, but there's some kind of particulate removal device uh, on the, uh, you know, between the SDAs and the stacks. So, you know, it, that's sort of the basic principle behind the operation. We're, we're creating the space for that chemistry to occur. Um, I think it's important to say that, uh, you know, a roughly in a system like this, that's um, removing SO2, probably something in the order of 80% of the SO2 that is removed occurs in the SDA vessels themselves. And there's also some secondary removal um, in the particulate collection device if it's a fabric filter. Uh, perhaps not so much if it's a precipitator, but there's also some maybe 20% removal occurring uh, on the surface of those bags as well. Okay, so common applications, um, I've already mentioned coal-fired power, uh, municipal waste to energy, I, I would say back to coal-fired power, you know, those are the largest of the systems. And I think in the United States starting in about the early 80s, um, and I think the last SDA that was commissioned in the United States was probably in 2012. Uh, that would have been Turk Station. Um, so these these systems have been in operation in coal-fired generation, you know, for the better part of 30 years, um, and continue operating today. Some some have been closed, but um, many of the uh, coal-fired power plants that are operating today use the uh, SDA technology. So those are the largest of the systems. Probably the next uh, most common would be municipal waste to energy. So trash, trash plants, trash burning power plants, uh, where you know they're uh, uh, processing municipal solid waste. Um, they're using the dry scrubbers to remove um, SO2, SO3, a lot of chlorides that are produced in the combustion of municipal solid waste. Um, a lot of heavy metals are being removed in the SDA vessels. So there's a, a the flue gas coming off the uh, waste energy boilers is uh, filled with things that we don't want to emit into the atmosphere. So the uh, spray dryers do a great job of removing most of those products um, in the municipal waste energy industry. 
Uh, coke oven heat recovery is another application. Uh, so in the steel industry, <clears throat> where the uh, coking ovens are producing a hot flue gas and a lot of that, the, the flue gas contains primarily sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride uh, coming off the coking ovens. Um, so, and that, those gases are captured. Some of that heat is, is also captured and used to generate power. But the flue gas has to be uh, cleaned before it can be emitted uh, to stay in compliance with regulatory requirements. So <clears throat> spray dryers are used in coke oven heat recovery, uh, both here in the United States and uh, internationally as well. And then finally, um, industrial incineration. So hazardous waste incineration. You'll see a few spray dryers used in, in uh, industrial applications. Um, not as common, perhaps, as some of the other dry scrubber technologies, for example, circulating dry scrubbers or dry sorbent injection systems. Um, we're not going to be talking about those other types of dry scrubbers today. We're really just focusing on the spray dryer absorber configuration. So those are the common applications, uh, principles, and uh, basic purpose. Um, so what we've illustrated in this first configuration here is what we call the uh, single pass configuration, uh, an SDA with rotary atomizers. So this is where in this example, there might be <clears throat> at least one, but maybe more than one rotary atomizer to spray those uh, slurries into the flue gas stream. Um, it's a very simple reagent preparation system. So we're receiving uh, pebble lime or calcium oxide is received on site. That calcium oxide is processed through a lime slaker to produce calcium hydroxide. So there's another chemical reaction going on in the lime slaker. And that lime slurry is then <clears throat> stored and pumped and sprayed through the rotary atomizers in this example directly into the flue gas stream. <clears throat> Water is also injected. Uh, in order to maintain humidity and keep temperature control uh, for the uh, <clears throat> SDA outlet temperatures. <clears throat> Pardon me. So this is a, what we call a single pass system, meaning that uh, the lime goes in once, it reacts once, it's captured in the fabric filter or whatever the, the, uh, the, the solid byproducts uh, from that reaction with the SO2 and the other acid gas constituents captured in the fabric filter, and then the, uh, the product is taken out to waste and disposal. So, you know, sulfur is basically, in this example, is what we're, we're bringing into the system as a gas, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, reacting it with calcium hydroxide, producing a solid byproduct, capturing that solid byproduct, and then uh, that solid byproduct is disposed of. So that's the basic sort of single pass, what we call a single pass SDA with rotary atomizers. Another um, configuration, which is pretty common, is the uh, SDA with fly ash recycle. So we'll just sort of illustrate the uh, recycle feature that some of the SDA uh, systems have. Um, and essentially, it's the same as the single pass system, except in this example, we're actually capturing some of that uh, FGD byproduct, the solid byproduct, and we are recirculating that back into the system as a solid. So it is conveyed from the fabric filter over to a storage vessel. Uh, the dry product is stored in that silo, and then it is fed into a second tank mixed with water, where that recycle called, we call it the fly ash recycle slurry, is then injected alongside the fresh lime slurry uh, to um, spray to, through the rotary atomizers and into the flue gas. Uh, this system is, was developed while orig originally by Joy Niro. It's commonly used now by many of the vendors who, who are uh, designing and building the larger systems. Uh, it's more expensive, but it saves a lot of money in, in terms of capturing uh, unutilized line and improving the characteristics of the spray system. And we're gonna talk quite a bit uh, in quite a bit more detail. Uh, about why fly ash recycle systems work and how they work uh, as we go through the, uh, the rest of this presentation. So this is an SDA with uh, fly ash recycle and, and rotary atomizers in this configuration. A third common configuration for SDAs is what we call the dual fluid nozzle configuration. 
Uh, so instead of uh, mechanically spraying that slurry through a, you know, the, the rotating uh, atomizer, the rotary atomizer, in a dual fluid nozzle, we were atomizing the slurry to distribute it in the flue gas through these uh, nozzles. And the nozzles, uh, the two fluids that we're referring to in the dual fluid would be the slurry itself and compressed air. So compressed air is being injected into a, into a nozzle configuration. Um, and then that, uh, those nozzles are distributed within the SDA vessel uh, in order to provide an even distribution of the atomized slurry into the flue gas as it enters the SDA vessel. So those are very common. Um, not so much in the coal-fired power industry, although we do see some dual fluid nozzle systems at large scale. Um, so, for example, the Baldwin facility in Illinois, that's the two 650 megawatt units uh, that are using the dual fluid nozzle technology. Uh, Basin Electric has the Laramie River plant. So there's a lot of legacy older systems, early dry scrubbers that were designed with uh, dual fluid nozzle technology. And nearly all, not all, but nearly all of the municipal waste to energy uh, systems are uh, dual fluid nozzle. There's a few uh, rotary atomizer uh, installations of uh, waste energy applications, but most of the waste energy uh, SDAs are uh, dual fluid nozzle. Uh, coke oven heat recovery, uh, most of these are, of the SDAs anyway, are, uh, are rotary atomizer um, and industrial incineration. Um, again, dual fluid nozzle on the smaller scale units is pretty common. So those are, you know, the, the three basic styles of SDA, uh, rotary atomizer, dual fluid nozzle, rotary atomizer with sort of, uh, sort of single pass rotary atomizer, dual pass rotary atomizer. The, uh, by the way, the, um, we're showing here the uh, dual fluid arrangement with fly ash recycle. Um, although that, as I said, many of them are, are not uh, fly ash recycled. So, Municipal waste to energy, for example, there are no uh, systems that I'm aware of that actually use the recycle feature. Uh, so pretty much all the uh, waste energy plants are single pass, dual fluid nozzle, or and a few uh, rotary atomizer applications. Coke oven heat recovery, again, these are all single pass. Um, and I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, industrial units with fly ash recycle, but uh, could be wrong on that. Okay. All right. Um, so let's just talk about the three things that dry scrubber users are concerned with in the operation and maintenance and ownership of dry scrubbers. Um, they are lime consumption, which is an operating cost, material accumulation, which is a problem in a common problem in SDAs, and corrosion, which is another common problem in SDAs. So we're really thinking about the long-term effects of dealing with uh, a costs related to lime consumption, costs related to material accumulation, and corrosion remediation. So those are the three things that we're trying to really kind of optimize uh, in terms of how we think about um, the way we run these systems, the way we operate them, and, and indeed the way they're designed. So the, really the, this presentation is to try and kind of build up, sorry, build up the story around the factors that affect lime consumption, material accumulation, and corrosion in SDA systems and how they're connected. Uh, but I wanna just focus on one um, for a moment, and that is lime consumption. Because lime consumption is the largest of these costs over time in the ownership of a SDA system. So, you know, a typical coal-fired power plant, you know, say at the 500 megawatt level, is probably using somewhere between two and five million dollars a year worth of lime. Uh, there's one facility out in, up in Canada that's using 27 million dollars a year worth of lime. So lime consumption is a, is a big cost to SDA users uh, across the scale. Uh, in coal fire generation, lime cost is probably the second highest commodity cost behind the fuel itself. 
So trying to reduce lime consumption, trying to optimize performance of SDAs is a, a big part of our, our presentation today, um, as well as you know controlling some of the problems that occur with them. So, but just talking about lime consumption, for example, here's a sort of a, a group of uh, SDA units in the United States. Uh, these are all coal-fired power plants, if I'm not mistaken, yep. These are all coal-fired generation plants in the U.S. operating SDAs. Um, and this scale on the left here is essentially the efficiency of the unit, or I guess the inverse of efficiency. Uh, really, it says uh, specific lime consumption, which is, in simple terms, how many tons of lime does it take to remove one ton of sulfur dioxide? Um, the theoretical, you know, the, the sort of stoichiometric metric optimum in fact, would be about 0 0.86 tons of lime is required to remove one ton of SO2 in that chemical reaction. Um, a couple SDAs have actually gotten better than that, and we can explain that uh, by fuel properties. Uh, but that's the point of this slide is that, you know, there's a lot of uh, SDAs operating in that sort of low one range. Uh, but you can see a lot of variation as well, and some are really way up at the top end here. So, you know, these these folks here are using, uh, you know, that one and a half and above, you know, we're using, you know, something in the order of twice as much lime as is theoretically required to remove the SO2 in these applications. Now, it's not really fair to put all these folks on the same scale and say that, you know, that these guys are unable to do better because there are differences in, um, in fuel properties, there's differences in permit limits, there are differences in configurations uh, that are gonna make it impossible for some folks to get down to the low end of this range. But I think what we, the, the point that we want you to take away from this is there's still a lot of variation in performance and there's a lot of opportunity implied by these. That, so can we find a way to get someone who is at, you know, 2.35 down to 1.5, or someone who's at 1.5 down to 1.1. You know, what are the prospects for improving performance? And it turns out that there are many factors uh, in dry scrubbers that can be changed to improve performance in terms of lime consumption and efficiency. So we just wanna kind of start with that statement. Uh, lots of opportunity to improve performance in most uh, cases. Uh, with SDAs. Okay, so that is sort of the conclusion of that first little segment. Um, it's relatively quick. Um, well, we're already up nearly 1030, so I guess I need to hustle along, right? Um, so that's the SDA overview, and I'm going to just pause here and, and ask Travis and Lauren, do we have any, any questions from our audience yet that we want to uh, tackle? So uh, one question for you, Stuart, so far. Um, so this is on kind of the configurations that you were talking about, the three different configurations. Uh -huh. um, and maybe you'll cover this later when you talk about, you know, the best practices and the design and all that. But is there, um, why would you pick maybe a rotary atomizer versus a dual fluid nozzle? Uh, uh -huh. There are specific, you know, process, for example, maybe a Coke oven versus the municipal waste energy. Um, is it just, you know, that uh, standard practice for that industry or is it better mm -hmm. for some processes? Um, can you speak on that a little bit? Sure. I think that the quick answer is economics. You know, in our experience, the dual fluid nozzle systems and the rotary atomizer systems have very, very comparable performance. In other words, you know, to meet a 90% SO2 removal uh, requirement, even more than 90% SO2 removal. Uh, there's not a lot of difference uh, between these two technologies. The dual fluid nozzles and the rotary atomizers are very similar. I think it comes down to long-term operating cost, um, you know, and and you know, given that the different vendors, the OEMs that produce these systems, have proprietary features. Um, it's really just a matter of you know what do you what are what are what is the OEM offering and and who has the best deal um, that can meet the the required limits. So I I don't think there's a lot between them in terms of actual performance. And I will say that 
you know, the factors that affect the performance in a dual fluid nozzle system are really the same as the factors that affect performance in the rotary atomizers. So, you know, the rotary atomizers are, I'd say they're similar in terms of power consumption. You know, the rotary atomizers have big motors on them, but, um, you know, to, to produce the dual fluid nozzle, you need compressors with big motors on them. So the actual energy consumption of the two are very similar in the end. Uh, so I don't think there's a lot between them and maybe just come down to, to preference and, you know, the, the, the decisions that are being made around the economics and the pricing uh, when, when the decision is made uh, to, to purchase one or the other. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, we did have one more question um, and it's also on that configuration. So can you speak on what the fraction of flue gas is to each of the two SDA inlets? Well, you mean in a parallel SDA configuration like this? Uh, yeah. Well, I, okay, we'll assume that is the, the, the meaning of the question. Well, it, it should be split perfectly evenly. Um, you know, in, in, in the ideal world, if I understand the question correctly. Um, but we're going to talk about that uh, as we get into the factors affecting it, because in practice, that flue gas is never split evenly between two SDAs that are operating in parallel or more than two SDAs. You know, and keep in mind that there are systems out there that have eight absorbers in parallel. And it's very common to see more than two, you know, three, five, four, eight. <laughs> So the, the, the way that flue gas splits between the two SDAs in, in this particular illustration is very important and it's never ideal. So I think, yeah, we'll talk more about that in the, in the coming segment. Um, so Stuart, we have a couple questions here in addition to the uh, SDA inlet. And I know you're, we're probably gonna cut the questions off here in a minute on this first section so you can get started on that next part. But what, uh, and I think you're going to hit on it too. Approach to saturation. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're going to cover that more in the next session. Is that the next section? Is that correct? Yes, we will. Yep. All right. All right. We'll just hold the approach to saturation questions till the next section then. All right. All right. Okay. Well, how about if we move on then? That's good. All right. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna talk now about the factors affecting SDA performance, including approach to saturation. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you what that means and why it matters. We'll talk about the way flue gas flows uh, split or don't split evenly uh, and why that's important. Um, and then we'll talk as we go through each of these factors affecting performance, we're going to try and kind of uh, conclude around lessons learned and common issues and best practices. Uh, and again, John is going to be uh, pitching in there a little bit to give you uh, all sort of the more practical perspective from uh, from the uh, plant plant personnel's uh, look on things. I think uh, let's start with the statement that many factors are going to affect dry scrubber performance. You know, so those three things we're interested in: lime consumption, uh, material accumulation in the back end, and corrosion in the back end here. Uh, a lot of things affect those. So, you know, if we were to put them all on one messy list, um, there's a, you know, dozens of factors that are going to affect the things that we're interested in changing. Uh, but and I'm not going to go through all these because there's too many of them. But I think what's important is to understand is that most of these we have no practical control over. So from the perspective of the operator uh, or the mechanic, the maintenance mechanic, you know, we can't change the volume or the geometry of the SDA vessel. We can't change the residence time in the fabric filter. We probably can't change the line that's in the silo or the quality of the water that we're slaking or reacting that line with. So, so there are many, many things on this slide that we just don't have any practical control over. So the thing is to say, right, well, what can we control? And that's a much smaller list. Um, only a few factors are controllable, you know, from a practical perspective. But I'm happy to say that these factors can make a huge difference in how these systems behave and how long, how much they cost to operate over time. So it's our business to help you understand how these factors affect performance 
and some of the things that have been learned about how to make them better um, over time. So that's sort of the intro. And we're just going to go back to, we're going to sort of focus on each one of these factors um, one by one and just sort of talk about how they affect it and why they're important. So the first thing to do is to go back to these three things that we're interested in changing and put those controllable factors into some sort of sense of how they affect. And I wanna first of all talk about approach temperature. I'm gonna define what I mean by that in a few minutes, but it pertains to this approach to saturation temperature that we had a question on a moment ago. Approach temperature is unique and critical um, because it's the only factor that affects all three of the things that we are interested in changing. So it's central to the performance of an SDA. It absolutely cannot be ignored um, and unique in that respect. And it's probably more important than everything else put together. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that this one thing affects performance on dry scrubbers more than everything else put together of the things that are controllable. So that's a big one. The next one would be fly ash recycle. Now, as I mentioned, not everybody has fly ash recycle. So that feature of recirculating some of that FGD byproduct or fly ash, um, if you have that, or if it is a component in the design is also a very important factor affecting performance, but it doesn't affect everything. It affects, directly affects lime consumption. It directly affects material accumulation and it interacts with approach temperature. So that's another factor that we're gonna talk about. The third one is atomization and dispersion. What do we mean by that? Well, atomization simply means, you know, how small are those little droplets that are being ejected from the nozzle of a rotating atomizer, a rotary atomizer, or a dual fluid nozzle. So how efficiently are we atomizing that slurry? What we wanna do is create a lot of surface area, and then we wanna disperse those droplets evenly into the gas stream. So how that slurry is atomized, and then how, that, how those atomized droplets are dispersed into the gas stream, uh, critical factors affecting lime consumption and material accumulation. The third would be SO2 control precision or you know, emission control precision. How closely can we approach the permitted limits of the facility and how tightly can we control uh, the, those emissions? Those, that factor affects really only lime consumption. Lime slaking, which is the reagent preparation side of it. You know, how reactive is the, is the slurry or the uh, reagent particles that we're producing. Um, and then air in leakage and insulation. Air in leakage and insulation affect material accumulation and corrosion. So these are, this is what we call the roadmap. This is basically the controllable factors uh, affecting SDA performance. And so we're gonna, you know, drop into and, and talk about each one of these individually, starting with approach temperature. So what is approach temperature? Well, first we need to understand the concept of dew point. Um, dew point temperature is also known as adiabatic saturation temperature, um, also known as wet bulb temperature. Those three things are not exactly the same, but for the purposes of our conversation, we can say that dew point temperature, adiabatic saturation temperature and wet bulb temperature are the same thing. What are they? They, they are the temperature at which water vapor in the flue gas condenses into liquid. So in every, you know, in the room you are sitting in right now, there is a dew point temperature. And, you know, that dew point temperature, if you're sitting in a room that's 70 degrees, the dew point temperature might be 30 degrees. And if you put a glass of ice water on the table, you can see that the condensation that forms on the outside of that glass is the water vapor in the air condensing into liquid water because the surface of that glass is at or below the dew point temperature. Now, one of the things we wanna remember in dry scrubbers is we wanna keep them dry. So when we hit the dew point at any point in the back end of a dry scrubber, bad things happen. 
because now we don't have a dry scrubber anymore. We have water or liquid or sulfuric acid or calcium chloride salt solution forming as a liquid. So the dew point temperature is absolutely critical in dry scrubbers. We need to keep the temperature above the dew point temperature at all points through the SDA and the back end, the bag house and so forth. Dew point cannot be controlled. There are too many factors that affect it in combustion processes. So boiler load, soot blowing, atmospheric conditions, fuel properties, the amount of slurry that we're spraying in, uh, boiler tube leaks if you're in a heat recovery application or generation application. All of these things affect the dew point temperature of the flue gas that is going into and out of an SDA. We have absolutely no practical control over these things, but we can measure it. And when we measure it, then we can control something called the approach temperature. And the approach temperature is simply the difference between the dew point temperature and the dry bulb temperature, uh, generally referred to at the exit of the SDA vessel. So what we wanna do is make sure that our approach temperature is a positive number. We wanna stay 30, 40, or 50 degrees above the dew point temperature at all times in order to make sure that we keep the dry scrubber dry and that we optimize performance. So understanding that dew point temperature changes and understanding that we need to keep the, uh, we need to stay above that dew point temperature by a safe margin is one of the critical aspects of dry, of SDA performance. Uh, it's critical because as I pointed out earlier, it directly affects lime consumption, material accumulation, uh, SO2 removal and corrosion. Here's a couple of quick um, slides just to kind of give you an illustration of, of how dew point is measured in dry scrubbers. So this is a dew point transmitters are uh, commonly located at the outlet of each of the SDA vessels. Keep in mind that the dew point temperature even in two parallel SDA vessels may not be the same because the characteristics of the flue gas entering these vessels may not be the same. Uh, the volume of flue gas entering the vessels may not be the same, the temperature. So there, each SDA tends to take on its own characteristic. And so the dew point temperature is ideally measured individually in each at the exit of each SDA. And the best place to measure it is directly at the SDA outlet. So we can understand the approach temperature. So what is the difference between the gas temperature and the dew point temperature of the gas uh, at this critical location? Uh, by the way, um, this instrumentation to accurately measure dew point temperature did not exist um, in SDAs up until really about 2010, 2012. So the bulk of SDA systems you know, in the world were developed without any means of measuring or controlling approach temperature, uh, but that technology is now available. So most of the folks in the, in the US, at least on coal fire generation, are now measuring and controlling approach temperature. Here's a good example of how the dew point temperature changes. Uh, this is a coal fired unit um, on the right hand scale here with the unit load of a coal fired generating plant ranging from a little under 150 megawatts up to maybe 275. Um, common uh, operation of coal fired power plants in today's market where you know they're up and down. Um, and here we can see uh, the, uh, this is the uh, dew point temperature at the exit of three SDA vessels. So this particular uh, configuration had three parallel SDA vessels. And you can see that the uh, approach temperature, excuse me, the dew point temperature is rising and falling generally with load. And it's not identical um, in each of the three vessels. So this just gives you a sense of how the dew point temperature is changing. Uh, and by the way, these numbers are very typical for SDAs, meaning that you know the dew point temperature, let's say is 120 meaning that we absolutely need to stay above 120 everywhere in the back end to make sure that our dry scrubber stays dry. Okay, so why is approach temperature important? Um, well, I've already mentioned it directly affects everything we're interested in. Uh, one example would be um, lime consumption. So if we, raise, if we raise or lower the approach temperature just a few degrees, five degrees in this example, it would typically affect lime consumption by 10 to 30%. So 
the efficiency of the scrubbers is extremely sensitive to approach temperature. Even a one degree change in approach temperature has a measurable effect on SO2 removal and lime consumption. And those effects are large. So when we talk about spending a couple million dollars a year in lime, uh, the ability to affect that number by 10 to 30% simply by controlling and changing approach temperature is a pretty powerful concept. So why wouldn't we just keep turning the approach temperature down? So as we get closer and closer to the dew point, the efficiency gets better and better and better. But there's a problem with that, and it has to do with material accumulation and corrosion. So as we get closer and closer to the dew point, as we run the risk of creating liquid in the back end, bad things start to happen. And those bad things are manifested in material accumulation and corrosion. So the question is, you know, where should that approach temperature be in order to optimize performance? Um, and it is where those two lines cross. <laughs> so when the cost of uh, of, uh, the, the cost gained by reducing approach temperature is offset, more than offset, by the cost incurred by uh, material accumulation and corrosion, then that's the time to say we've gone too low. That's also the spot where operations and maintenance butts heads. <laughs> <laughs> right. The operators are and the owners are pushing this to the left going, hey, let's save more money online. Uh, but yeah, exactly. So. Um, yeah, so some common issues and best practices. Um, you know, approach temperature, as I said, it, it, um, was uncontrolled in almost all dry scrubbers um, built prior to or operated prior to 2012, roughly. There were one or two that were that did it from the get go with, um, you know, sort of a, a, a less than ideal way. But 95% of all the dry scrubbers built in the, in the US anyway. Um, or operated before 2012, did not have any means of controlling, measuring or controlling approach temperature. Uh, so the common issue is that it's uncontrolled. Um, and, and I don't know of any waste energy units that are actually controlling approach temperature, although we would, we would argue that they ought to be. Um, so, you know, common issues, it's not controlled. Um, it's hard to measure, you know, the dew point, the reliability of the dew point uh, transmitters and sensors is a tough challenge. Um, and then once you have reliable measurement, then controlling it accurately, as I said, just a one degree change in approach temperature has a measurable effect on stack SO2 and emission and lime consumption. So control precision is very important. Um, and often there's lots of issues with control precision as well. Uh, and the best practice is to, well, measure approach temperature, control it, and control it precisely. So if we put in an approach temperature set point, of 40 degrees, we want to maintain 40 plus or minus one degree on a five minute rolling average basis. Okay, so that's approach temperature. Uh, we've got quite a bit more to go through yet. So um, any other comments on that from your end, John? No, it's just <clears throat> the best practices um, is sometimes hard to uh, keep the operator's hands off the control system. Uh, in order to have that uh, real tight plus or minus one degree operating um, range uh, when operators see excursions in SO2, you know, their operators, their immediate reaction is they want to change the control system and bump up the line flow and it will settle out on its own over time. So that's just uh, something that always uh, affects the line consumption because the operators don't want anything bad to happen on their watch. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, moving on. Um, we're going to talk uh, about fly ash recycle now. Again, recognizing that many dry scrubbers don't have fly ash recycle, so we're not going to dwell on this too long, but most of the big ones do, and it does make a significant, uh, or it has a significant effect on lime consumption and material accumulation. So again, this is just the sort of the basic illustration of what we mean by fly ash recycle. I already covered this at the top of the, of the webinar. So we're taking that uh, fabric filter byproduct, we're collecting the solids and making it down into a slurry. We're wetting it with water and then we're re-injecting it alongside the uh, fresh lime slurry uh, reagent in the systems. 
Um, so why does this make a difference? Well, <clears throat> it has to do mostly with, with the dispersion. So if we look at, uh, you know, a mic if we put our lime slurry under a microscope and we, we zero in on those little particles of lime slurry uh, uh, here in the left, if you leave those lime slurry particles all by themselves, they tend to clump together. So there are, uh, you know, electrostatic forces that cause those particles to attract each other. Uh, so they will clump together into these chunks, meaning that those uh, little particles on the inside of that clump really do not get exposed to the SO2, to the flue gas. So a lot of lime gets wasted simply because it's not being exposed or dispersed efficiently. However, if you put recycled particles, which are much bigger, um, you know, the recycled particles are sort of on the scale of, uh, you know, a basketball compared to the lime particles that are sort of the size of a marble or maybe a golf ball. Um, what happens is the, the electrostatic forces change. So the, the fly ash particles actually attract the lime particles. And so those lime particles stick to the outside of the fly ash particles. And what that does is it breaks up these clumps and allows every single one of those little marbles to be exposed to the flue gas. So we get a, a, a huge increase in effective surface area of the lime slurry to be exposed to the flue gas. So there's a lot more efficient utilization of the fresh lime when we put these fly ash particles together with it. <clears throat> in addition, those fly ash particles also spread out the water. So the fluid that is, you know, the water that's being injected to humidify the gas and control temperature also spreads out around these fly ash particles. And that when it spreads out in a thin film around a big sphere, that provides more surface area for drying. So the water dries a lot more efficiently, more effectively, just because again, we're giving it more surface area when we spread it out over the surface of a fly ash particle than if we don't and we just throw it in there as a droplet. So fly ash uh, helps in two ways. It disperses the lime and it disperses the water for more efficient drying. Common issues, uh, well, again, um, measuring recycled slurry density, controlling recycled slurry density to a, you know, with precision, uh, dealing with you know the issues that occur, so these tanks tend to get clogged up. There's a lot of issues that occur in recycle systems. Material accumulates in the vessels. Um, it sticks to the walls. It forms it forms a cement-like substance that will harden in the tanks. It will harden in the piping and the valves and the instrumentation. Uh, so there's a fair amount of maintenance that goes into these recycle slurry preparation and control systems. Uh, not only that, but there's the ash conveying systems, the silos, and all the stuff that goes with this. So there's quite a lot of capital cost that goes into this. And then there's a lot of O&M cost that goes into these recycle systems. That's why we don't see them on the smaller units, because the economics just aren't there. You know, we may reduce lime consumption by 30 or 40 percent, but if it costs $50 million to install and operate the recycle system, that's not gonna make sense unless the scale of the system is large enough to, to justify it. Anyway, best common issues, best practices. Um, if you have a system, more is better. So increasing that recycle slurry rate, or excuse me, inc increasing the total recycle rate. So the more of that fly ash we can recirculate back through the system, uh, the more money we're gonna save, uh, the less material accumulation we're likely to have in the, in the spray dryer absorbers. So it's a, it's, a, it's a feature that you really wanna focus on if you have it uh, by raising that slurry density and raising that recycle rate up to the maximum achievable within the limitations of agitators, slurry pumps, flow control valves, atomizers, et cetera. Yeah, and this is where the operators really need to be engaged uh, with checking the uh, recycle ash density, um, take, a, take samples, um, check it, uh, compare it to uh, your uh, density meters to make sure that you have maximized that uh, density there. Um, occasionally, uh, you're going to see that build up uh, in the piping. Uh, the operators used to call it liquid sandpaper uh, going through the piping. So there's a lot of wear issues, um, and you just got to stay on top of it.
All right. Thanks, John. All right, we're going to move on from flash recycle to atomization and dispersion. Um, let's, uh, we're going to, I think, how are we doing for questions here, Travis and Lauren? Are we uh, stacking stuff up or should we jump into this next segment? We, we have a couple of questions. Um, okay. If you, if you want to take some, then I can ask them now or we can hold them either one. Yeah, well, let's, let's take a couple of questions now. Okay. Uh, one, one question that came up here just in a couple minutes ago is for low sulfur municipal solid waste combustion with SDA, are there any applications where the fly ash or spent lime has got a beneficial use like concrete or uh, oh. aggregate type industry? I know that comes up a lot, so. <laughs> yeah. I think we had a whole track on that topic um, at the Dry Scrubber Conference a few months ago in Columbus. Um, and I am going to defer that question by simply, or sort of address it very briefly by saying, we're all trying to find beneficial reuse for these products. You know, the low sulfur, there's a lot of alkalinity in these byproducts, a lot of unutilized lime. Um, some folks are using it for uh, road building. Some use it for other types of waste remediation. Uh, it has been utilized. Certain types of FGD byproducts have been utilized for, um, you know, cement making or cement brick making. Uh, but it, it's a very, very difficult challenge because the properties of this ash is generally too variable to make it useful in a lot of applications um, that need a consistent product in order for it to be useful. So I, we're not experts on that field, but I can tell you that there's so many questions around it and some folks have found beneficial reuses, but most really struggle to find it. Um, and I would say MSW ash is even more tricky because there's a lot of heavy metals bound up in that MSW ash. So, um, you know, there could be some environmental challenges re related to uh, finding beneficial reuse for it. Okay. And um, going back to a previous question, the question you had before about the flow splits going into each of the inlets, uh, there was a clarification on that. They were referring to the B&W Niro style where you have inlets uh -huh. at the top. And do you know what the splits are that and then does that split vary as a function of load variations? Yes. <laughs> okay. And we're, that's a perfect segue into the next segment. Um, so because we're going to address that specifically and we're going to talk about the split between the two, the roof and central gas dispersers in that specific design. So we're, we're going to we're going to hit that one right on in a few minutes here. So I'm going to defer my answer to that until we get to that slide. But uh, what? Uh, anything else we want to jump on? Okay, uh, Lauren, do you have? Uh, did you see any additional questions or have any additional questions? Nope, I think that was it. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into it then. Um, so atomization and dispersion. Um, as I said at the top of the call, or it's, you know when we were talking about the roadmap, atomization and dispersion. Uh, affects two things we're interested in, lime consumption and material accumulation. Uh, so when we say, by the way, material accumulation, I'm really referring to the accumulation, the excessive accumulation of material in the SDA vessels and immediately downstream of the SDA vessels, and sometimes also in the, in the bag house hoppers or the fabric filter hoppers where it can hang up. But most of the problems around you know, ex costs related to material accumulation are due to material accumulation in the absorber vessels themselves or immediately downstream in these outlet ducts leading into the fabric filter. So, you know, atomization and dispersion are really crucial um, in reducing or affecting um, that material accumulation as well as lime consumption. So again, um, let's just look at sort of the basic configurations here. So. This is a kind of an illustration, um, you know, 3D modeling of um, a dry scrubber that has three parallel SDA vessels. Uh, this, by the way, is the uh, configuration uh, that most commonly provided by uh, GE Alstom. Uh, so that's Travis's company. So this is, you know, with the uh, triple, triple atomizer, triple rotary atomizer arrangement. So the flue gas is coming in. 
um, through these three individual, they're called finger ducts. Uh, each finger duct leads to an atomizer well. Each atomizer well has uh, a gas disperser and an atomizer in it. And you can see this common header. So when we talk about dispersion, we're really we're referring to, you know, how evenly is that is the slurry being sprayed into that flue gas? Well, one of the biggest problems is that the flue gas is not evenly balanced between these different ducts that are heading this way. So if you look at the total amount of flue gas going into each of these three SDAs, you very commonly find, in fact, you will always find that they are not the same. And in fact, the difference can be significant. There can be up to a 30% variation between one or the other of these three SDAs. In addition, the flue gas flow split between the three finger ducts can also be different. So, you know, you can see variations in flow rate through the finger ducts. You can see and often see variations in temperature. So there's a lot of dynamics going on in these systems that we don't really have very much in the way of practical control over. And in many cases, there's a problem related to that because the flow rate through these atomizers is the same. At least it is the same in this SDA. So these three will all be the same, but the flue gas flow rate through each of these finger ducts may not be the same. So there's a tendency to overspray or underspray. In other words, for the dispersion to go out of balance, to be putting more, too much or too little of the slurry into the flue gas that is entering through each of these specific finger ducts. So, you know, there's only so much we can do about that, but it is a problem. And that's what we mean by uh, a dispersion issue that can occur in this type of configuration. Um, and by the way, this, this configuration is also used by other OEMs. For example, Hamon um, utilize the uh, triple atomizer downflow arrangement for their SDAs as well. So it's pretty common setup here. Um, again, what can we do about it? Well, we can measure some of these things. We can measure temperature fairly easily. So we may be able to bias the atomizer flow rates. And that's a common feature of the GE Awesome design. Um, it's difficult to measure gas flow rates. In fact, so far impossible um, in, in our experience uh, from a practical perspective. So we are sort of limited to how much we can um, balance those, uh, those gas flows and slurries. Um, okay, let's talk about, you know, sort of, oh yeah, a couple of pictures. Um, you know, this is, this is a, 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 an illustration of material accumulation in the outlet duct of uh, SDA. So uh, here we are looking downstream uh, from, we're standing basically at the SDA outlet duct. We're looking downstream toward the bag house in these pictures. Uh, you can see the scale of these ducts, you know, it's a, compared to the guy standing there. Uh, these are the guide vanes that are you know, directing the flue gas uh, around the corner and then up in this example. Uh, this is an example of the kind of the quantity of material. You can see the shovel here. <laughs> We're talking, you know, and this, by the way, is after 80% of the material had been removed from the SDA outlet duct. So this is just an example of what we're trying to avoid um, and the cost associated with material accumulation um, in this example at the back end of uh, an SDA. Um, some of the, you know, um, tactics to improve these would be, you know, uh, computational fluid dynamics or CFD modeling uh, at the back end of an SDA. So this shows the outlet ducts coming from two SDAs. The SDAs are not actually shown here, but these are the two outlet ducts from us, from uh, one from each of two SDAs coming into a common header feeding the bag house. And you can see just areas of low velocity um, which would be um, areas in which we might expect material to accumulate. So there are some ways that we can kind of model this and maybe improve the geometry in some cases, but uh, just sort of give an example of how folks try to uh, solve some of those material accumulation problems. Uh, <clears throat> so moving on to the different, uh, and this is the BNW or Joy Niro configuration of the SDA. Um, so this is a little different than the GE Alstom or Hamon. Um, in the uh, BN, Babcock and Wilcox design, it's a single rotary atomizer located in, at the center, the geometric center of the SDA vessel. <clears throat> and in this design, the gas comes in from two, so, from two points. Uh, there's this, what they call the central gas disperser, where the gas comes in, it splits basically up here, and it's, it splits between the central gas disperser coming up through the bottom 
going through that disperser vein pack. And then the roof gas disperser, which is a sort of <clears throat> a circular arrangement. And that uh, roof gas disperser distributes the gas in a sort of a swirling motion through the disperser veins and down through uh, past the rotary atomizer uh, wheel. So these two gases come together, they're coming together in opposite directions <clears throat> and they form sort of a mushroom shape. And the idea is to spray that slurry directly into the center of that mushroom <clears throat> to disperse the slurry evenly into the, uh, into the flue gas. <clears throat> so the question came up, what should that flue gas split be? Um, it should be 60% to the, ideally, uh, the OEM recommendation is 60% of the volume of the flue gas should be to the roof gas disperser and 40% to the central gas disperser. And I think the, the, the audience question was, well, <clears throat> does that change with load? And the answer is, well, I, I don't actually know for sure, but there are certainly signs that point to it changing based on load. Um, although, you know, the, the systems at Startup and BMW do a pretty good job of balancing those those 60-40 splits. Um, so while it may change to some extent, we don't think those changes are significant as long as it's, it is it is 60-40, you know, when the unit's at full load. <clears throat> and uh, so if it is correctly balanced at full load, the, the odds are that the balance is going to be within tolerable changes as you ramp the unit down on load. So the real problem really is, is not the effect of the load changes, it's the effect of wear and tear and plug ups and other issues that get us away from that 60-40 split. Um, and then this mushroom cloud starts to take on a distorted shape um, resulting in material accumulation. Um, so, you know, this is a picture of the inside of a, of a B&W vessel. And you can see the, just the tip of the central gas dispersor. So we're looking up into the SDA vessel in this example. Uh, so you're just seeing to the left there the, uh, the, the veins on the uh, central gas disperser. Um, and here you can see the uh, material accumulation on the wall of the SDA vessel. Uh, this is pretty significant, um, certainly not the worst that we've seen, uh, but this is an example of how material can accumulate on the wall of, uh, of an SDA vessel. That stuff will build up like stalactites. It'll, it'll, it'll eventually get unstable and and crash down into the bottom of the SDA vessel. Uh, it'll, it'll accumulate perhaps, depending on how the SDA vessel hoppers are evacuated. And it can also find its way into the SDA outlet duct. That's also the area you're gonna have a lot of corrosion going on underneath of mm. the buildup. Yeah, good point, right. Yeah. So this material accumulation does tend to trap um, trap compounds that uh, cause corrosion. So yeah, common problem in that particular design. Some of the things to talk about around atomization and dispersion, um, you know, the atomizer wheel itself. So this is just a little bit of a focus on the rotary atomizer configuration. Um, this wheel is turning at, you know, 10 to 12,000 RPM. Uh, the nozzles are arrayed radially around that nozzle. So it's really just a centrifugal force of that spinning motion that um, imparts velocity to the slurry that then goes through the nozzles and it's atomized. Uh, those nozzles can get plugged up, which will cause a in, in, incomplete atomization. It will also cause in, uh, let's say, uneven dispersion. Um, worn nozzles, you know, so they fail over time that those solids going through the nozzles will wear them out. So those are some of the factors affecting atomization. Um, Dispersion can be affected very significantly by wear on the dispersers. So this is a couple pictures of the roof gas disperser veins. Um, so that gas is flowing through these dispersers, but the gas often contains particulate matter, you know, fly ash from the boiler. So that will wear out these, uh, you can see the holes in the disperser veins here, holes in the floor. So that allows leakage and bypass and interferes with, you know, the, uh, the proper distribution of flue gas into the uh, into the SDAs. Uh, here's a picture of uh, you know sort of a screenshot of a dual fluid nozzle system. So you know switching out of rotary atomizers and into dual fluid nozzles. Uh, in this configuration, there are two. This is sort of a schematic, if you will, from their control panel. Uh, two SDAs sitting side by side. Each SDA actually has 20 nozzles in it. 
So, you know, should the flow rate through all those nozzles be the same? Or, you know, if the gas is entering from this side, should the flow maybe be balanced in these nozzles to try and get an even distribution? So again, um, trying to figure out how to distribute that atomized slurry in the flue gas, especially in dual fluid nozzle systems is um, a little trickier because we have a lot more pieces to work with here than we do in uh, rotary atomizers. So it's an important uh, component of both types of systems. Uh, nozzle condition um, in, the, in the dual fluid nozzles. Um, so again, just like the rotary atomizers, these nozzles wear out over time. So the efficiency that uh, they actually produce the atomized slurry uh, changes and, and deteriorates over time. So some common issues here, and this will be true to some extent with both types of systems, you know, poor drying because of partially plugged or worn spray nozzles leading to material accumulation in the spray chamber because, you know, we're not atomizing the slurry. We're just basically blowing, you know, a garden hose full of slurry into the, into the gas stream. So it won't dry, it'll hit the wall. It'll accumulate somewhere inside the vessel and cause trouble. Um, some best practices, um, while some of these are specific to dual fluid nozzles, but, you know, maintaining the nozzles, inspecting the nozzles, making sure that the wear is, is acceptable using actual measurements, not just somebody's opinion, but measuring the actual nozzle bore diameter and the, um, the bore wear patterns are important. Knowing when to rotate the nozzles or change them out is very important. Uh, per, you know, atomizer preventive maintenance is important. Uh, flushing practices are important. So there's a lot there that uh, can affect atomization. Um, just a couple of other pictures of material accumulation as a consequence of poor atomization and poor dispersion. Um, you know, this is uh, sort of what happens when the SDA fills up with solid matter. You have wind up with a, a pretty significant mess. Um, this is not only uh, an economic cost to deal with that, but it's also in some cases a safety concern as well. Okay, we need to move on here. We're a uh, quarter past the hour. We have another, uh, what, 18 minutes remaining. Um, so uh, just to kind of wrap up atomization and dispersion, um, I would say, you know, the common issues on the B&W design would be the SDA gas imbalance. That is to say, you know, the gas, the total gas going to each absorber, each SDA can be out of balance. And then the specific split between the roof gas disperser and central gas disperser, very common to see that looks good for the first few years of operation, but then as the wear and the tear um, and material accumulation begin to make themselves, uh, you know, manifest themselves, that 60-40 split goes out of balance and that increases uh, material accumulation of the problem. So, uh, you know, keeping track of the, uh, uh, the wear and the condition of the dispersers is very important, turning veins, et cetera. Uh, on the GE Alstom design and really all of the designs, uh, the similar designs like uh, Hamon that use that triple rotary atomizer arrangement at the top of the SDAs, uh, it's the finger duct flow imbalances that are really causing problems with dispersion. Uh, and again, the same problem with, you know, just the split between two SDAs can be imbalanced as well. Uh, so, and then nozzle maintenance, of course, is uh, really important. So best practices, uh, you know, measure the flue gas flow distribution. Um, in some cases, it can be continuously measured or calculated just by looking at the thermodynamics. Uh, understand how it's, you know, how the balance is changing over time. Use that information to know when to go in and inspect uh, disperser veins or ducts. Um, repair those baffles, you know, keep maintenance on those disperser uh, packs and the turning veins is important to maintain the appropriate gas flow distribution. Uh, regular preventive maintenance on things like screens and strainers to keep solids out of the out of the atomizer nozzles or at least oversized chunks out of the atomizer nozzles. Um, regular preventive maintenance of atomizers themselves, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, keeping track of nozzle wear, rotation, etc. And flushing practices are important, making sure that we're we're flushing enough, but not too much. Too much flushing is a problem because it interferes with process control. Uh, interferes with drying. If we're just putting straight water through an atomizer, it won't dry as readily as the slurry as well. So 
uh, we need to flush just enough to uh, stick, keep ourselves out of trouble, but not too much. So that's atomization in this version. Um, any comments on that one, John? Yeah, the the uh, measuring the flue gas flow, it's it's pretty easy to add test ports. And um, what we had done in the past was utilize our uh, stack test vendor to come in and measure the measure the flow, uh, measure the SO2. Uh, you already have temperature in most cases coming in, and um, knowing that having that information is then going to give you the means to potentially, you know, modify inlet dampers to uh, change the, uh, the the flow patterns and all. It's not something unless you want to make a big capital investment that you would do continuously, but at least you know you have an issue. Um, a lot of times it depends on your your air heaters and uh, which direction they're turning. Um, the uh, all the uh, maintenance stuff on the atomizers, those regular PMs are are big, and depending on your particular configuration, uh, you know if you have multiple atomizers, it's not such a big deal to swap one out if you have a vibration problem. But when you don't, um, like in the the B and W Joy Niro configuration, uh, a lot of planning has to go into that and uh, making sure that uh, you have spare atomizers ready to go uh, is huge. Thanks for that. And I will add to that, that that all of the OEMs that you're familiar with do provide the test ports. So there will be an array of, of ports um, in these finger ducts and in the critical uh, locations of the, um, of the inlet ducting for you to be able to measure that. So, you know, B&W provides it, uh, those uh, the areas that you can traverse these inlet ducts to measure the 60-40 split. So there are provisions in these systems for the flue gas flow rates to be measured. Again, you can only do it, you know, uh, one at a time, but uh, very worthwhile doing. Okay, um, so that's atomization and dispersion. I think we're just going to push through here at least another segment or two before we pause again. Um, so I'm gonna just, just a couple slides here. Um, wanna talk about uh, air in leakage. Again, uh, going back to our roadmap, uh, air in leakage affects material accumulation and corrosion uh, or insulation. So loss of heat, basically, uh, whether it's we're losing heat because you know, ambient air is being pulled into the system or because the insulation has failed and we're losing heat to the outside. Uh, both of those things have the same effect, which is to increase material accumulation and uh, and, and corrosion issues. Um, so we just have the one slide on this. Um, I think the thing to say is, well, okay, where does it really, why does it, when does it happen? Where does it happen? Um, you know, people, you know, just leaving, leaving a, a port open, um, not properly closing or sealing an inspection hatch. Uh, those are common sources of air in linkage. Probably more common in our experience would be um, failures of the expansion joints. So where those ducts are brought together and there's a big, you know, rubber expansion joint. Um, there's a lot of issues with those expansion joints. They fail over time, they leak, and we start sucking in cold air um, in through those expansion joints. Uh, this picture is more of a, of a a, a sidewall failure of an SDA due to loss of heat. So just the insulation failed. So the temperature of that inner wall is dropping below the magical dew point temperature. And when that wall temperature drops below the magical dew point temperature, very bad things start to happen very quickly um, around corrosion. So not only are we condensing water, we're actually condensing sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, saturated solutions of calcium chloride salt water uh, on you know regular carbon steel. So some of these vessels may be coated, some of them may be lined with stainless steel, but it's never a good thing. Uh, most of them weren't, you know, as supplied by the OEMs. Most of these are just straight up carbon steel walls. So they can disappear very quickly. You see it a lot around 
the the doors like in a bag house you'll see it there and then to further talk about where the expansion joints are typically those aren't insulated and all the uh, ductwork and flanges right around where the expansion joints are tend to have some corrosion issues and that's that's from uh, the outlet of the uh, scrubber right or scrubber and and right on through the bag house right through the id fans yeah all the way through John, I think one of your colleagues, uh, Scott Taylor at Kearney's Point, um, presented a paper at one of the Dry Scrubber Users Conference some years back in which the total value, uh, the cost that they had, that had been incurred to repair corrosion in the back end was something in the order of $14 million from, you know, from start up to that time. Yeah. And, um, I think you can attest to the fact that there was another number of million dollars spent just, well, earlier this year. Yes. Uh, at, at Carney's Point. <laughs> yeah, we, we uh, um, uh, both in both cases, uh, like we replaced entire sections of ductwork with coated ductwork uh, to come back or changed out whole sections of uh, baghouse walls and floors and put them in and then coated them. Uh, most of this stuff coming from the OEM is just uh, you know carbon steel prime painted, which uh, quickly uh, goes away. Mm -hmm. um, the scrubber itself, we had uh, at Carney's, we had uh, replaced in that kind of like spray zone uh, around that middle band. We had already uh, relined a section of that with stainless, and then later discovered that other areas above and below that were also uh, corroded and thinned to the point where we were in danger of uh, a collapse. Um, mm -hmm. And so we had to go in and uh, temporarily support the entire scrubber vessel and uh, you know, repair with rolled plate uh, before we could uh, safely resume operation. Because you, you forget too that it's not just the uh, weight, but you've got all that area of the uh, plant is all under negative pressure. So you've got, uh, other forces at work as well. So it, there's, yeah. there's a lot going on there and you have to be very vigilant about checking it and uh, UTing it and uh, maintaining all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Both the, yeah, and, and I, go ahead. I was just gonna say there, there are many documented major structural failures of SDA vessels, not just B&W, but the other OEMs as well. Right. Okay, so you know, yes, there is a, a specific vulnerability on the B and W systems or joint IRO systems, right where that spray cloud exists. You saw that picture of the material accumulation on the wall. So the real, the the, the Achilles heel on the B and W systems is right here uh, at the elevation of that spray cloud, where we get a lot of uh, under deposit corrosion. There have been multiple structural failures. Um, and many instances where structural failure was narrowly avoided um, by measurement and realizing that there needed to be reinforcement and repair. So, so that's one of the problems on there. I would say just not to leave everybody sort of thinking that that's, that's unique to this design. Um, on these designs, um, the vulnerability is down in the hopper. So the corrosion problems on these systems is typically happening right around the spring line where the hopper connects to the sidewall. And then there was at least one major structural failure where the hopper actually fell out of the spray dryer absorber due to corrosion of the sidewall. A lot of extreme corrosion on the SDA out, excuse me, the hoppers the events, um, and more commonly on these systems in the outlet ductwork as well. So uh, lots of money spent and some uh, significant uh, safety um, and overall plant reliability issues related to uh, SDA corrosion. So uh, I think that the message here is air in leakage and insulation failure are two very common causes of corrosion. Um, the, there, are some, there are some others like that specific under deposit corrosion that we're talking about on the BW units, which is sort of a unique thing. Um, but in all cases, uh, it's something to be very, very aware of. Um, it can be not only expensive, but potentially harmful. 
So go looking for um, air and leakage, hunt it down ruthlessly, um, use techniques, um, thermal measurement, acoustic measurement. Uh, beehive smoker is a great way to see where air is getting sucked into the insulation. So if you if air, if, 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 if ambient air is getting pulled in, to uh, a ductwork, especially near things like expansion joints, then you know you have a problem. Uh, and that airing leakage is gonna be very damaging very quickly, yeah. or can be. Next time you have a heavy rainstorm, that's a good time to be looking at it. You know, it'll yep. expose it. Okay, so we're running out of time here. We got our five minute notice up, so we should probably uh, jump through this and then uh, maybe take one or two final questions before we, we uh, adjourn. Uh, SO2 control precision, um, going back to the roadmap, I'm sorry, it, it's really, uh, it's a factor that really only affects line consumption. Uh, but you know, that's a big number. So we want to control SO2 as precisely as we can. Uh, that's really about instrumentation and automatic control systems to make sure that the, uh, the delivery of that fresh lime slurry reagent is controlled to maintain the stack SO2 set point. Um, so a couple of common issues, you know, transient load operation, which is very common these days in, at least in coal fire generation, um, is a problem because it challenges the, the system to try and, you know, control to a specific uh, stable set point. Um, uncontrolled approach temperature. So if approach temperature is not controlled, it's very difficult to maintain a precise stack emission set point. Um, and inappropriate control. So often you'll see that the you know the set point for stack emission is in ppm, but the permit is in pounds per mmbtu or pounds per hour. So it's just the way that systems are controlled. Uh, best practices: uh, control approach temperature. Uh, make sure that your automatic control set point is is in the same units as your emission your limiting uh, emission permit limit. Um, try and control within 10% of the permit limit. Uh, with a control precision of plus or minus 5% on the three hour rolling average. So those are sort of the best practice standards for SO2 control precision. Um, and then finally, lime slaking, and we're gonna have to kind of hustle through this one. Um, there's a lot to be said about lime slaking. We could probably spend another two hours just talking about that. Uh, suffice to say that, you know, lime comes from uh, the ground, it's quarried, it's prepared, and it's calcined in rotary kilns to produce calcium oxide. So the base product material is, you know, coral reef. Calcium carbonate produces calcium oxide. Uh, that calcium oxide is uh, reacted in the lime slaker, typically on site uh, where the dry scrubber is located, to produce calcium hydroxide. That's a very highly exothermic uh, and potentially hazardous chemical reaction. Um, known as slaking. Um, there are a lot of, you know, safety concerns, I think. Um, and I, I think the, the, the takeaway from this is that because slaking is a highly exothermic reaction, um, there's a lot of accidents that have occurred. And I would say most of the lost time accidents that pertain to SDAs have something to do with the lime slakers. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, Stu. That's a big spot uh, where PPE is, is absolutely mandatory. Goggles, gloves, uh, face shields. Um, I've had so many guys uh, get lime slurry burns, and uh, that's just nasty stuff to deal with. Yeah. Many factors affect lime slaking. Again, um, I'm not going to talk through each one of these today as we're running out of time, but there's a lot to be learned about how to control the slaking process, how to optimize the process to produce a highly reactive product. That's what we're looking for. Um, and that kind of leads me to the, the wrap up here. Um, so I'm just gonna pause real quick um, with only a couple minutes remaining. Um, Travis and Lauren, do you, want, do you wanna throw any other questions at me before we adjourn? Yes, yeah, Stuart, one more for you. Sorry, I was trying to find the uh, unmute button. Um, so this is on um, the lime side. So the question starts, for DSI with hydrate, particle size is crucial. Is there any benefit in milling quick lime prior to the slaker? 
Okay. Um, no, is the quick answer, not in our experience. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true. Um, it's it, slakers of the sort that we're discussing here, okay, it's a lime slaker, conventional lime slaker, will generally produce a higher pro quality product if the pebble lime is not pulverized. Um, and the reason is that if we do, well, the believed reason is that when you grind it up, it, it causes the, those particles to air slake very quickly. So even if they're in the presence of air for a short time period, they, those particles will react with the uh, humidity in the air, which will make them less reactive in the slaker. So in general, we, we, we see better product quality coming out of slakers where that quick line is not pulverized or ground up in any way. Perfect. Um, and that was the last question. So I think we can go ahead and, uh, and wrap up. Okay. All right, well, um, I think just to, to basically wrap it up, we're, um, we've covered the basic principles, we've covered the um, applications, we've covered, let's skip down to the bottom here, we've covered the roadmap. Uh, remember, you know, these are the things that we can control. They matter, uh, they make a huge difference to the long-term life expectancy and the long-term operating cost of SDAs. Uh, we're still learning. We're still accumulating best practices. Uh, I would encourage you all to uh, join. If you're not members of the Dry Scrubber Users Association and this topic interests you, please please join the association and participate. Uh, come to the conferences, um, join in and, and get involved. So um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. And uh, thank you, Lauren and Travis, for, for facilitating and moderating today. Um, and I think, um, the bottom line is uh, there are other questions. Uh, we can address those later, but uh, I suppose that needs to be it for today. Yeah, Thank, thanks, John and Stuart. And uh, you, you did my wrap up for me, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> once again, thanks, thanks everybody who joined. Uh, if you have any questions hanging over there, like like Stuart indicated, you can send us an email, let us know, we'll get to, get to them and we'll distribute those to everyone uh, on the call as well. The recording for this will be loaded on the YouTube channel within a couple days. We've got to get some stuff worked out there to get it loaded, and it'll also be on the DSUA website as well. So um, thanks, everyone. Thanks, John and Stuart. Thanks a bunch to Lauren as well for coming on and moderating this, and thanks for joining, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye.